Hello, welcome to the first official lecture video. As explained in the course materials, there aren't videos for every chapter, but here at the onset of the course, I really want to make sure that you are getting off on the right foot, pointed in the right direction, having a really good grasp on our focus, and um, we're going to do things in a rather unique way. I have a handful of slides here that I've created, and this is going to be a little bit longer than any any subsequent lectures because I've got a little introductory um, set of slides that I want to go over with you. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to have the book open on the screen. I'm going to draw your attention to some things. It's easier so that you know where to put your focus. If we were in a classroom together, I would have people um, sitting there with their books open. We would go through things together. Obviously, you still have to read independently. I just feel that it's easier if you see what it is that I want you to really pay attention to. So hopefully this is going to work well for you. But let's begin with some introduction because I am very passionate about this subject matter. It really is me. Food in all regards is my passion. And since a very young age, it's been a big part of my life. Um, when I was knee-high to a grasshopper, I had people in my family who were humoring me in all regards. When I was five years old, I had a little kitchen set, and they would give me stewed tomatoes and crackers to crumble into pots so that I could make little dishes of food. I was using Play-Doh and shaping it into food, and people were either eating the stewed tomatoes and crackers or pretending to eat the Play-Doh and telling me how wonderful it was. I was encouraged to get in the kitchen by the time I was nine I was making dinners regularly my father was bringing me cookbooks and at 11 I was throwing dinner parties I was never intimidated by food because no one told me to be intimidated by food and that's what's so great when you're a kid is that you can learn so much because you're not fearful additionally I was fortunate enough to grow up in a somewhat healthy home um, lifestyle Certainly by today's standards, there are a lot of people that are much more health conscious. But just to give you some insight, my mother refused to buy any kind of um, soft drink or soda, whatever term you like to use. It was a very rare treat on special occasions. Um, my parents literally never ordered a pizza in my entire childhood. We almost never went out to eat, which was largely a financial thing, but also somewhat of a health conscious thing. And so I had a mother who prepared food regularly and encouraged me to do the same and I never really thought outside that box. Um, as I grew older, like many of us in today's culture, I had my own concerns um, about what I should or shouldn't be eating. I think today's younger folks, it's more environmentally driven to have those concerns. Um, but there definitely remains that cultural uh, issue with regard to our vanity, our aesthetics, our appearance. And so there's certainly lots of um, focus on some of the wrong points still. Regardless, that was something that was an impetus for wanting me to take an interest in food beyond just its preparation. And I developed a fascination with what is food doing to the inside of our bodies? How does it affect our health? And so I was off and running from there. So I had the advantage of attending school to learn to be a chef, um, owning a catering business and cooking lots of unhealthy foods for people and reaching a point where people began to ask me to cook healthy foods. And then I've had a very diverse background um, in many respects, most recently culminating in television shows and radio shows focused around nutrition in Virginia before I relocated to Florida. And now I'm blessed to continue on my mission here in a multitude of ways. And I do hope that you find this exciting and interesting and inspirational and empowering and all of those things. And what I hope more than anything is that this is not at all what you expected, because if you walk away from this with the same ideas you came into it with, then I have failed you. I have failed on my mission here um, as a representative of nutrition science and how amazing that it is. So hopefully you're as excited as I am. First things first, I'm going to ask that this be your mind. I'm going to ask that you take a giant eraser 
to your mind and erase all the things you think you know, your preconceived notions, those deeply ingrained tidbits that our society has impressed upon you. You've heard so many things from so many different media sources, magazines, TVs, internet, whether it's blog, Facebook articles, you name it, friends, family, well-intentioned and otherwise people marketing products. We're all subject to this, sometimes consciously and sometimes unconsciously. And I have found in my 25 plus year career in the nutrition field in various capacities that it is very hard for people to unlearn what they think they know. Um, I get a lot of pushback and resistance because people just can't believe that what they thought they knew wasn't right. And here's what it kind of comes down to. Most of the information you have been subjected to falls into several categories. You either got what are sound bites, little snippets, and in and of itself that statement might be accurate, but taken out of the larger context of knowledge, it takes on a different meaning and often a skewed meaning. So let me give you a perfect example. Nothing drives me crazy more than the fact that people say that things like bread, rice, and potatoes are carbs. First of all, there's no category of food called carbohydrate or carbs. Carbohydrates are a nutrient, a molecular structure, a chemical structure of a substance known as a nutrient. So you're going to learn all about that here. Most foods, with two exceptions, meat and eggs, contain this chemical nutrient structure called carbohydrate. So yeah, bread, potatoes, and rice have it, but so does just about everything else as well. So we speak incorrectly because we are misinformed, oftentimes because the information we're getting is in these short snippets. It wasn't from a course such as this one, or it came from some sort of a diet mentality, right? The book, the class, the presentation, the blog, with some sort of a specific goal, and therefore the information is going to be presented in such a way that it influences you based on the end point. So we can't cover everything in one semester and in one course, but this is a big book because there's a lot to cover. So even if I don't have time to address everything in this book with you, I'm asking that you read it, not just now, but hey, go back and read it later. This book is a fabulous resource for you. By and large, most of you are here because it's a required course for a bachelor's of science in nursing. And so I'm going to say something really honest to you right now. I've been in healthcare for a long time, and most of the misinformation that is communicated within the healthcare field comes from two primary sources that people interact with, physicians and nurses. Why is that? Well, physicians, if you don't know it, are not educated in nutrition. They are educated in health sciences from a procedural and pharmaceutical standpoint, which is fabulous because it is absolutely needed. But prevention is not what physicians are trained in. They are trained to handle problems that require other adjunctive therapies or singular therapies, such as pharmaceuticals or other procedural interventions. So they diagnose and they treat things in ways that individuals can't treat them themselves. So most of the medical schools in this country don't even include a single nutrition course for physicians. That's not an opinion, that's a fact. As far as nursing goes, many of you are already RNs, so you know that the two-year program for nursing does not require nutrition. It can't possibly include everything. The BSN program requires this one course, and depending upon where you take it and who teaches it, you may learn more or less. So I'm very much a seasoned professional, and I hope that I'm going to be able to give you some unique insights, and I hope that you will be able to take those as you move forth and accomplish several things. First and foremost, help people. We're in a helping profession. Let's help them. Let's not make things harder. Let's help them. Help them by informing them correctly. Help them by helping to erase those things that are tidbits of misinformation that are planted in their minds. Help to 
be positive and take away the negative and help to let people know that doctors and nurses don't know everything about nutrition and that's why there's a discipline within the health sciences field that does. Registered dietitians, otherwise known as registered dietitian nutritionists, that is my background. Your book is going to teach you about it. You're going to learn more about the discipline. You see, guys, you don't have to be the expert in everything. You're not supposed to be. There are many things that doctors and nurses do that I, as a dietitian, know nothing about. And by the same token, there are many things that doctors and nurses don't know about nutrition and what we as registered dietitians do. So we are a team. And the more that you know, the better teammates that you and I can be. So please let go of whatever it is that you think you know, or you may currently be practicing. That's your business, what you do. But you're here to gain knowledge that allows you to be a qualified and competent healthcare professional. And hopefully it will benefit you on a personal level as well. So this is what we're not here to do. We're not here to focus on fad diets. I'm not here to talk to you about which diet gets you the best abs, which diet makes you the skinniest. That's not our focus. Our focus is on health. It's not on vanity. It's not on aesthetics. It's not on things that people can do to achieve extreme results in a short period of time. We're here to talk about health, both the prevention of disease and disability and the amazing ways in which we can use foods to manipulate disease and disability. We can't always erase diseases, but we can help delay their progression or their related comorbid issues, which means things that happen subsequent to an initial disease process that make a person's physical and mental life that much more taxing and challenging. We can help people stay healthy and we can help people with illnesses not to become more unhealthy. But this stuff here is part of the problem. Fad diets, television shows, blogs, all of the hype that surrounds things. You know, you may or may not know this, but there were actually research studies done on these particular television shows by graduate school students at a big university in this country. And they were enlisted to watch all of these shows and document the claims or statements that were made and then dig into the actual health sciences research to see how much of it was accurate. And it was astounding to see the outcomes and the extremely low percentage of accurate statements communicated. Let me put it in perspective. Why does a television show exist? Well, to entertain you. So it's got to be sensational. Same thing with radio and magazines and other sources. If you don't keep the sensationalism coming, you lose your audience. Well, why does anyone put an advertisement in a magazine or on a television channel while a certain show is running? Because they look at which media is getting the largest audience. Who moves the most magazines? Which shows get watched the most? So those magazines and those shows want those advertisers who will pay a premium price, and that means that they've got to keep their audiences large because they make their money off the advertisers, not the audiences, right? And so you've got to do whatever it takes to pe keep people engaged, even if that means unscrupulous practices and less than accurate statements. Dr. Oz actually went in front of a congressional committee and to put it mildly got his hand slapped um, by professional boards and Congress for borderline stepping on breaking laws in many ways. So obviously I'm not going to sit here and bash every name I can think of, but I can tell you that if you walk away from this not understanding how to differentiate between valid science and hype or misrepresentation, then you've really missed a huge benefit of this course. And your goal as a healthcare professional is to do just that, to help people differentiate between sound information 
and unreliable information and you're entering into a healthcare field full of other professionals who don't have strong skills in doing so, you can be the exception and go forth and help others. You know, ultimately we live in a society where everybody these days is a nutrition expert and yet Everybody knows so little because they're so confused. It really isn't that complicated. We don't need to bash everything. We don't need to make everything black and white thinking. The reality of it is that there are shades of gray. You want to know the scientific realities. You want to understand how your body works. You want to understand why we have to eat, which is to get these amazing chemical substances called nutrients that act at a cellular level within the trillions of cells in our body to enable our anatomy and physiology to function as it should. And when there is an imbalance of nutrients, then we have cellular dysfunction, which results in anatomical and physiological dysfunction, which is the manifestation of disease and disability. However, those imbalances aren't as stark as all of today's hype leads you to believe. We don't have to be extremist about everything. In fact, that's more the problem than not. We are eating in extremist ways both positively trying to influence our health and negatively for those of us who are just eating willy-nilly without giving it a thought. It really needs to come back to the basics, the simplicity of balance and variety. The adage, everything in moderation, really is true, but we have a really poor concept of that. Those of us who don't even attempt to focus on how we eat tend to eat certain things in excess because we're not attempting to strive for balance and moderation. And those of us who think we're so stellar often swing to one end of the pendulum to extreme and fear other things. That's not balance either. So let's go into this with a healthy perspective because we can resolve our own confusion and that of others. This is not what health is about, but you live in a society where everything is focused on how you look. And the fascinating thing is that you rarely pick up any kind of a uh, publication or website that says, let's focus on your labs, L-A-B-S, which reflect your internal biochemistry, the function of your anatomy and physiology. So I'm gonna tell you guys, I'm all about the labs, over the abs because that is what health is about. So fear mongering is what I aim to dispel in all of my educational endeavors, whether here as an educator at this level or as a health educator with an individual or doing a public speaking engagement or writing professionally, um, any of the things that I engage in, I seek to help people establish a positive mindset because let me tell you, health begins at the top and it trickles down. So I have a master's in food science and human nutrition and I have a master's in educational psychology. And what I understand very well is that our mindset influences our behaviors and sometimes what we think is a healthy mindset is really an extremist and unhealthy mindset. It's a fear-mongering mindset. Any mindset that says, bad, bad, don't do that, that's awful, is creating fear and stress and anxiety. We need to learn to relax and focus on balance. And we need to learn to help other people realize they're not bad for the choices they make that there's always room for improvement and that that can happen subtly and slowly and that is okay because as long as you're aiming for the end game of mental and physical good health in balance, then that's what it's all about. So when you begin to read your book, holistic health is what we are focused on in your book will use that term holistic means looking at the big picture sometimes people hear the word holistic and they think that it's referring to alternative methods that's not what it means we're still focused on science-based methods 
It means looking at someone's emotional and physical, their financial, occupational, spiritual, sociocultural, and intellectual environment. In other words, we can't just have canned statements or advice that's applicable to everyone across the board because, hey, we're all very different people. You've seen in your introduction post how different we all are. We can't walk around saying everyone should eat this or not eat that because sometimes for religious reasons we don't eat things. Some of us have unique allergies. Some of us have certain financial constraints that maybe are to our advantage. If you ask me, one of the best things about not having a lot of money is that you can't afford to eat out a lot because eating out a lot is what gets most people in trouble. By the same token, people of limited financial means are more likely to eat out because from a sociocultural perspective, they may not have the resources to do a lot of other fun things in life, and that's their fun, happy time. So then they're more inclined to choose things that are less healthful. They're also more inclined to eat at establishments that have some of the most unhealthful food. So you see, it's very complex when you're focusing on the holistic nature of a person. And so there's a big movement in healthcare today to think holistically and to individualize or tailor our suggestions and feedback to the person we're dealing with. And here's the real challenge, guys. There's not a lot of time for it. Think as you move forward, how will I be able to focus holistically on the people I interact with professionally and communicate meaningful things to them about their own self-care responsibilities in one to three sentences, in two to three minutes of time that I often will have? Therein lies the challenge. So you can see why we too in our daily lives are subject to so much misunderstanding because that's how we get our information. But we as healthcare professionals, it's our duty and our challenge to which we should rise to figure out how to send positive messages, productive messages, accurate messages, and personalized messages within the limited time constraints that exist in our profession. Are you up to the challenge? It takes practice, but you can excel. So let me begin our journey by pointing out that we are focused on health. Yes, we are going to look into why it is that an emaciated body or cachexia, which may be a new term for you, that's C-A-C-H-E-X, I A, when people are wasting away, why that is compromising their health. And yes, there is a degree to which excess adiposity, A-D-I-P-O-S-I-T-Y, too much body fat, can be problematic for health. But too little and too much of anything is subjective. In other words, a matter of opinion until you measure it in an objective fashion, meaning using laboratory parameters and anthropometric measurements. And so we cannot judge a book by its cover. That's what you have to understand. You look around at people and you make mental judgments about their health. Now, if you see someone who's morbidly obese and they're smoking, that's probably not too incorrect of a judgment to think their health is probably at risk. But there are certainly room for variations, or rather is room for variation in body size. And you don't know what's going on on the inside. You'd be amazed at some people's physical abilities that look to you to be average. Ah, uh, you think that person looks what I call reasonable or normal, and yet they have no strength. They have no muscle mass. They have no endurance ability, and their labs are awful. You look at someone and you go, that person's probably unhealthy, and you'd be amazed at what kind of stamina they have, and their labs are stellar. We have to think in terms of the body function, anatomy and physiology. We must measure it objectively, not subjectively. So you're here because you're in a health sciences program and nutrition is one of the health sciences. 
Much of what you are bombarded with is nutrition opinion. But it's not about opinion, guys. It's a science. Like any science, there are facts. So one last thing before we begin to really delve in so that you are clear-headed about this. Science is what requires disciplined, rigorous study. Yes, I know you think of laboratory experiments, and that's one way to conduct science, but not all science can be conducted in that way. Much science is conducted through what we call observational studies, and most nutrition science is conducted in that way. We look at the long-term effects of certain behaviors. For example, we can look at cultures in the world and other parts of the world who eat no animal foods whatsoever. It's part of their culture, whether it's for religious reasons or um, certain sort of conditions where they live. And then we can look at cultures who have animal heavy diets, like our culture here in this country, in this part of the world. And we can look at disease rates and we can see that certain diseases are non-existent in those non-animal consuming cultures and are very prevalent in animal consuming cultures. And we can draw correlations. And then we can go, okay, it looks like there's a connection. We can drum it down to studying particular animal foods. We can do the same with plants. And then we can drum it down smaller and smaller. Science is very complex to study. It's not easy to do. There are many what we call confounding factors, details that we can't necessarily factor out or factor in. And so there's always going to be room for improvement and there's always going to be room for doubt. But by and large, everything that you are being taught in all of your BSN courses is based on rigorous science. None of its opinion. We are teaching you what has been studied. Might new studies uncover new findings? Oh, by all means, it happens every day. So as you progress through your education and your career, some of what you learn may have to be modified, and that's not a bad thing. That's progress. But I'm here to tell you the current evidence-based facts in existence in terms of nutrition science. The things that in pre at present we understand pretty thoroughly, despite what you may have heard to the contrary. So one more time, please take that eraser to your mind, and despite what you may choose to believe on a personal level, or what you may choose to do personally, put on your BSN hat, your health professional hat, and be prepared to embrace the knowledge you need to possess and exercise for that purpose. So in today's world, unfortunately, you are going to encounter a lot of people suffering from what we call lifestyle related diseases. In fact, the most common causes of premature death, dying too young and disability unable to function as you should, and the most preventable diseases, all the things that hit the top of the list, are lifestyle related. Too little movement, too much stress, imbalanced diets. And what you're going to begin to realize is that while food can't cure every problem, and there's a lot of hype out there that says it can, and as much as I hate to say it, it can't, the power of food is immense in preventing disease and in helping manage many disease conditions. Nutrition is a science and it's fascinating. It in takes into account maintenance of all body tissues and functions, growth, and that includes healing, right? It's responsible for cellular reproduction, which enables human reproduction. And it takes into account what we take in, how we absorb those chemical substances, 
called nutrients, how we bring them together through assimilation, how we biosynthesize things. Bio refers to life. You have to know that prefix to appreciate. And synthesis is really the production of something. So your body is bringing things together and creating things. You take in food, your body breaks it down and releases its chemical constituents called nutrients. And then at the cellular level, it takes those little pieces and parts, those chemical substances, and your genes, your DNA, tell the cells how to reassemble, how to biosynthesize the things that the body needs, new molecules that can be used in a whole variety of ways to enable the growth or reproduction of cells that create and repair anatomy and enable physiology. If right now you are stumped by the terms anatomy and physiology, then that's where you're going to begin, is to get yourself familiar with all of these scientific terms. Anabolism means building up. Catabolism means breaking down. Your body is in a constant state of anabolism and catabolism cell turnover. You're made up of trillions of cells. They come together to form structures called tissues. Tissues come together to form organs and organs form organ systems and all organ systems are interconnected to form an organism called a human being. You're going to hear this and see this again. I think we all know excretion, right? We are excreting waste products in many ways through our pores, through exhalation when gases are released. Our urine and our feces are primary means of excreting waste products of metabolism as well as excess nutrients that would otherwise be retained and build up to health, um, unhealthy toxic levels. So the body is this amazing factory and nutrients are absolutely essential to sustain its processes. And when the body doesn't get the nutrients it needs or it gets more than it needs, the disruption of its processes takes a toll. So you're here to study anatomy and physiology, biology and chemistry. If you've taken a chemistry course and you didn't quite understand it, it might start to make more sense now. You'll at least understand why you needed it. Biology is the study of life. And you have to know all the pieces and the parts, the anatomy, and how they work, the physiology, to make sense of it all. So I'll tell you over all the years that I've been teaching health sciences courses, especially nutrition, that many people then say I had a better grasp on anatomy and physiology and even to some degree biology and chemistry after a nutrition course than I did after I took all of those individual courses. So hopefully it's going to help you in many ways. So what we're here to look at is the science and the amazing things that we have learned about nutrition. So I'm going to change screens. Hold with me for one moment. And I'm bringing up your textbook. So here, the preface, nutrition and diet therapy for nurses will be a staple in the library of nursing textbooks. Important. It encompasses all aspects of nutrition, building from the foundation of nutrition principles up to the peak that is medical nutrition therapy to construct a solid evidence-based approach to the practice of nutrition. So we're going to look at all the pieces and parts of nutrition, and then we're going to look at how they are actually applied. Medical nutrition therapy is what I, as a registered dietitian, practice. It is the utilization of nutrition as a medical therapy. It's not just for disease prevention, it's for treatment or management of illness as well. And we use an evidence-based approach, meaning all of the things that we know and apply are based on evidence gleaned from scientific research. So evidence-based medicine 
is the core of health sciences here in this country. There are other principles of medicine practice in other parts of the world, often referred to as Eastern medicine, whereas this is Western medicine. Those would be things like homeopathy, um, acupuncture, um, and other sorts of alternative methods. Those are not things you're gonna learn about here because they're not considered scientific or evidence-based medicine. While Western medicine practitioners may embrace select Eastern practices such as acupuncture, which actually has some evidence behind it, um, many of the other things that you might hear about are not embraced within our practice. So we're focused on the evidence-based approach to the practice of nutrition. Nutrition science is an evolving field like all sciences, having come a long way from simply linking foods to prevention of nutrient deficiencies. In fact, what you're going to learn is that deficiencies are the least of anybody's concerns, at least in developed countries like our own. So you're going to be fascinated to learn that all these supplement stores that are making billions of dollars every year and people in multi-level marketing selling us all kinds of uh, vitamin, mineral, and other dietary supplements are largely unnecessary because deficiencies are the least of our concerns because we have a plentiful food supply. Taking in more than we need is a bigger problem in today's world in a hundred years' time. We've gone from having to worry that people weren't getting enough of what they needed to being focused on the fact that people get too much. Too much food equals too many nutrients equals imbalance. So over nutrition is a bigger problem in today's world, at least in developed countries like our own, than is under nutrition. There are issues with disease states that impair nutrient absorption and therefore deficiencies are possible and we will get into that at a certain point in the course. So again, nutrition science is an evolving field and it is often difficult for the patient to sift through the media, marketing promotions, the neighbor's advice and the internet to find the facts. So as I said before, now more than ever, it is crucial that nurses possess the knowledge and skills to translate the science of what we know about nutrition and its role in health maintenance and disease prevention and be a reliable resource to the patient. Finally, nutrition is not just about vitamins and minerals anymore. Topics such as cultural competence, meaning understanding different people and their lifestyles in nutrition care, knowing about herbs, the pros and the cons, knowing about sports nutrition supplements, the pros and the cons, being familiar with trendy weight loss diets and the pros and the cons, and even the effect of specific fatty acids, knowing that fat is good, but how much fat is good and which types are best and which types should be limited, and drug interactions with foods or nutrients is important. Today, we have a pharmaceutical heavy society, right? Polypharmacy. Poly means multiple, so polypharmacy refers to um, multiple medications, pharmaceutical medications being at use. You live in a society where many people are on more than one prescription medication, especially the people you're going to deal with in explicit healthcare environments. And so there are many interactions between foods and drugs. Some foods will make it so that people absorb um, too much of a nutrient. And it's not the food that's the culprit, it's that certain foods have a lot of a certain nutrient and it's going to encourage absorption. Or they have another chemical substance, because remember, foods are just chemicals. So they have another substance perhaps that entices the body to absorb too much of the drug and then it becomes a toxic dose or just the other. There's a nutrient or another chemical substance in a food that impairs the body's ability to, to absorb the pharmaceutical. Therefore, it can't elicit its effects. There are also many over-the-counter substances such as nutrition supplements that people utilize that actually are drug-like substances, which is why people are inclined to use them in the first place, and therefore using those in conjunction with pharmaceuticals is like a double whammy and thus harmful. There are so many things to know, and we're going to touch on them all, 
And the more time that you invest in carefully reading in the textbook, the more confident that you're going to feel. So let me just show you very quickly here as I scroll through the pages that there's an emphasis on this all being about evidence-based research. So while I may not have questions for you on every chapter assignment that addresses everything within the chapter because there's just not enough time for that, that doesn't mean you shouldn't read these things. These are nuggles or kernels of knowledge that you want to impress upon your mind. Cultural considerations are very, very important. Again, we're in a melting pot of people here in this country. We need to understand that everyone has their own ways of doing things. Culture refers to every element of a person, right? It is their race, their religion, their ethnicity, their personal values systems. It doesn't mean that everybody came from a different country. It doesn't mean that we just have different skin colors with in one group of people of the same ethnicity and race and religion, there is still cultural diversity, things you believe in, ways that you were raised, what you've been exposed to, knowledge level, literacy level. It's the complexity of the individual that we have to take into consideration. You're going to see lifespan boxes, which are very much geared towards the nursing profession, so all the more relevant. You're going to see all kinds of little interaction boxes. Like I said, very important to pay attention to this. Again, not simply whether or not it's on an assignment. And then what's really great is that you also get these little practice pearls. You get a moment to kind of step back and ask yourself, am I grasping things? How can I use this information? And the hot topics. Um, maybe you even want to print out some of those things for yourself and keep them for later reference. And then there are these patient education checklists. That's another good thing to glance at. You don't have to scrutinize all of that in gross detail. Just give it a looking over. Decide how much time you have to look at these case studies. When you have the time, look at them. It's a mental exercise, a real world exposure. Ultimately, you're focused on the nursing process throughout this, and again, we're always making an assessment of people and subjective is really a matter of opinion whereas objective is a matter of facts you've got to grasp this so if you're going to put something in your notes right now this is a fabulous place to start hopefully you realize you can pause this video at any point and be taking notes i encourage you to at least write down um nursing process so you can go back and look at the book and do this Focus on it throughout. Um, you have the exam style questions that many of you care about. So this is a great time to rehearse for that. Um, I am not doing the labs with this book. So I didn't require that you access any of those supplemental materials. Critical thinking is hugely important. Critical thinking is all about not seeing things one sided. Uh, I teach this in student success courses and in psychology courses. I don't have time to teach a lot of critical thinking as a concept in this course, but I encourage you to appreciate that critical thinking is all about being able to look at the big picture, the shades of gray. Few things in life, much less in health, are black and white and we have to be able to look at that big picture and not go extremist and and accumulate facts and reasonable concepts um, and draw logical conclusions based on that. So moving on to chapter one, what will you learn? Every single time you get to a chapter, start right here. This is what you want to stop and think about. You want to know why you care about the chapter. What is it that you should be taking away from this? And at the end, come back and ask yourself, did I accomplish this? Did I learn these things? As you move on, you're always going to see this did you know, and you're going to find that on occasion I ask you to copy this because it makes you stop and think about it. Copying the very words helps imprint them in your mind. It draws your attention to this. Don't just copy it and not think about it. Lots of key terms. Some of you probably know some of them. For many of you, they are new. 
the very first thing you should do is look at the key terms and decide which ones you're more or less comfortable with. My suggestion, because from a psychology standpoint, there are certain things that help us learn, is that maybe you make flashcards. As you're reading, make flashcards with the term and on the other side, the definition. And after you've done that, look at the flashcards. If you have any weaknesses, go back and read that section. You have to have multiple exposures and opportunities to process or synthesize information for it to really sink in. I want to reiterate, too, that the things we are covering here are applicable to many of your other courses. So it's going to help you in all of your other courses. I think you're going to be amazed by that. So you're going to learn about anthropometric data. <clears throat> the measurements we use, weight, height, waist circumference. You're going to look at BMI. Now let me tell you something, and this is something you might want to put in your notes. BMI, body mass index, has been used for a long time because it's a really simple way. People walk in, they step on a scale, we can check their height. The equation for BMI takes into account height and weight, and it estimates what somebody should weigh. And it says, oh, your weight means you're too little or you're too big. It's very subjective. It's not really accurate. It's cheap. It's fast. It doesn't require any special training. So it's popular. But those of us who are more forward thinking and more progressive and more cutting edge, if you will say, realize it's not a great tool and it's starting to become out of fashion. So you are seeing in more and more healthcare settings equipment that people can use to actually assess their body composition, what they are made of, how much of them is lean mass, muscle, cells, bones, fluid versus adipose tissue, fat tissue, because the ratio of lean mass to adipose tissue is a determinant of health. Too little lean mass is just as unhealthy as excess adipose tissue. If you have too little lean mass and excess, that's a double whammy. But somebody can look what you call normal or healthy on the outside. <clears throat> Excuse me, running out of voice here. And they can still have too little lean mass on the inside and therefore their health is compromised. We're actually starting to term that very casually skinny fat. So BMI, it's going to move out of fashion and in the terms of your careers you're going to see body composition used more maybe you've had the opportunity to have your body composition measured a common method is a machine that is metal and you stand barefoot on a metal platform and you hold the metal rods the handrails and what happens is it runs an electrical current through your body and that electrical current travels more rapidly through lean mass than it does through adipose tissue and the machine through physics is able to assess your total body composition and give you the percentages, which is the gold standard for measuring your internal composition in terms of health. When you couple that with biomarkers, laboratory assessments, meaning blood tests, then you're able to get a very comprehensive and most accurate view of somebody's internal anatomical and physiological function. So keep a grain of salt set aside for BMI. Don't take it overly seriously. You're going to start learning about macro. Macro is big. Micro is little, right? So the macronutrients are, in simple terms, the big nutrients. Why are they big? Well, the three macronutrients, carbohydrate, protein, and fat, are unique because they are the three nutrients that contain calories. The micronutrients, vitamins and minerals, are non-caloric. So carbohydrate contains 4 calories per gram, protein contains 4 calories per gram, and fat contains 9 calories per gram. We have to eat a mixture of macronutrients because we need a certain number of calories to fuel our cells every day, and each of those three respective nutrients serves unique roles within our biochemistry. So we can't just get all of our 
calories from protein and or fat and neglect carbohydrates because carbohydrates serve other functions in our body. And we can't get all of our calories from carbohydrates and fat and neglect protein because protein serves vital roles. Balance and variety are what it's all about. So you're going to learn how the nursing process involves nutritional screening. In many healthcare settings, the nurse is the first person that a patient will encounter, and so some evaluation or screening is necessary, and it is that screening that will in turn flag other healthcare professionals like physicians and registered dietitians to let them know what they need to be concerned about so that they in turn can evaluate the person further and intervene as needed. We're going to look a little at the nutrition facts food label so that you can understand better how to utilize this tool. So you'll learn about it early and then I'll integrate the understanding of that into the future. So hopefully you're starting to see some consistency between my message pre-book and now that we're into the book and hopefully you're taking some notes and then you're going to go back and read. So you're going to learn about the DRI, the dietary reference intakes. Think of this as the entire collection of all nutrient recommendations based on science. We have been able to determine what a body needs based on scientific research. We've been able to understand what is necessary for a man or a woman or a child at any given age, at any stage of life to use in order to often optimally function, excuse me, optimally. If we know what it takes for optimal function, then we are able to determine what happens when there's not enough of something or when there's too much of something. And that allows us to say, hey, this is the best amount to get. Don't get less than this. Don't get more than this. Nothing is an exact science. All of the recommendations are padded or have a margin of error because we're continually learning, right? That knowledge is evolving. So there's no need for anybody to be counting exact milligrams or grams of any nutrient in the real world. In a healthcare setting, the only person who's going to do that is a registered dietitian, not even a nurse or a doctor. We are able to calculate as dietitians exactly what somebody needs, but our exact calculation is not even exact, right? It's based on generality. Then we're able to ask people what they eat, and if they're honest, that's the clincher, of course, we're able to mentally estimate how many grams and milligrams of things they're getting. And then we can compare it to what their estimated needs are. Estimated intake compared to estimated needs. And if there are gross deficiencies or excesses obvious, we can address those. So yes, you're going to hear a little about milligrams and grams, because we had to set some sort of a reference point. But there is no way for anybody to actually track those things accurately because the recommendations aren't exact and the values for what's contained in foods aren't exact because there's just no way to measure them in foods exactly. So ultimately, this is what I want you to take away from this. It's all about helping us achieve adequacy. The DRI are the collective guidelines, and that's what's being emphasized in your book. The idea is not that you get a certain amount within a given day. The idea is that it all averages out over time. You know, some days I eat more of certain things and less of other things. I didn't get enough maybe of certain healthy foods today because it was an off day. And other days I make up for it. The idea is that these are the minimum recommended and maximum safe levels in order to promote good health and prevent disease. Once a disease exists, this information is useful because if we know what a normally functioning body needs and we understand what is wrong 
when a body isn't working right, then we know that that changes their needs. For example, potassium is something that anyone with no diagnosed health conditions, no known health conditions can benefit from. We all need lots of fruits and vegetables to get lots of potassium because it has many beneficial attributes to our health. But if our kidneys are impaired, if they don't function correctly, well, one of their key roles is to excrete the nutrients we don't need. We take in what we need and we excrete what we don't need so it doesn't become toxic. But in people whose kidneys are starting to stop working correctly, then their body can't excrete that excess potassium and it builds up inside of them. And an imbalance of potassium disrupts homeostasis, the balance in the body. And it can have devastating effects like cardiac arrest, meaning death, the heart stops. So you see, you're going to learn first about what a healthy body requires so that later you understand why unhealthy states require modification in terms of nutrition. There are many tools that have evolved over time. And you're going to read about this in your book, so I'm just going to give you this little quick, interesting snippet. Once upon a time back in my early days, we had the four food groups before we knew much. You know, I like to say in my lifetime, most of the current knowledge around nutrition has come into being. It's amazing what's happened in a <clears throat> relatively short period of time. Um, we then had the food pyramid. And you know what? The food pyramid is fabulous. If you don't know what it was intending to communicate, it's saying that most of what you should eat should be whole grains at the bottom. So you see, bread, rice, pasta, not bad. The problem is that people don't focus on whole grains, unrefined grains. So you're going to learn about that. We want to see people eating things that have a lot of natural fiber in them. And we want people to get adequate carbohydrate, which is the body's primary source of fuel, not excess, adequate. And when they're getting it from healthy, nutrient-dense, that means a lot of nutrients are present, food sources like whole grains and fruits and vegetables, you see the largest portions of the pyramid are whole grains, fruits, and vegetables. When you're eating those foods primarily, you're getting carbohydrate that exists in whole grains, fruits, and vegetables for fuel. You're getting fiber that has so many amazing functions in the body that you're going to learn about. That's only found in whole grains, fruits, and vegetables. You're getting phytochemicals, which are not a type of nutrient, but they are an amazing chemical found in whole grains, fruits, and vegetables. And there are many different phytochemicals, thousands of them. In fact, we don't even know them all yet, but we know they have powerful influences on health. So the message was eat lots of plant foods, whole grains, fruits, and vegetables. Plants are where it's at. That is one thing that everybody can agree on in terms of nutrition. And don't eat a lot of the small sections. Don't eat a lot of animal foods, but there is room for animal foods, dairy and meat. It doesn't mean anyone has to eat dairy and meat because the food pyramid, if you could see this picture more closely here, you would realize has alternatives as well. Beans, nuts, and seeds are plant foods that have a lot of the same nutrients as meat and dairy, so they can be used as an alternative. You're going to learn about all this. And the tip of it said, don't consume a lot of added stuff, like added oils, or added butter, or added sugar, fats, and sugars. Let's focus on foods that contain them. And let's add a little, but keep it to a minimum. There was a lot of controversy over this pyramid. Um, politically, this is very interesting. The USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture, agriculture refers to farming and animal rearing, the production of food. So the USDA has two responsibilities, and they are in direct conflict with one another. One is to educate consumers by creating things like the food pyramid. The other is to help promote 
agribusiness, the businesses surrounding animal rearing and growing of food. Obviously, this food pyramid is pushing for those who grow plants and is discouraging people to engage in business with animal rearing uh, farmers. So they got a little upset and they said, yo, USDA, you kind of dissing us over here. You know, that's not right. Well, scientifically, it is accurate, which is the intent, but political interests often trump best interests. So they reconfigured the pyramid and they created what you see at the top with the color coded um, little columns there. Now, if you're like most people and polls were taken, you look at that and you go, aside from maybe the purple one, it looks to me as if there's not much difference. And so that made everybody in agribusiness happy, and it confused the consumer. The positive was they added the person walking up the steps to emphasize the importance of physical activity. But again, controversy ensued because nutrition professionals like myself said, whoa, what happened to actually educating people in the best interest of their health? So billions of your tax dollars were spent, and ultimately we came round to my plate. It is a general representation. It is meant to indicate by looking at the plate, you see that three quarters or 75% of the plate is emphasizing plant foods, vegetables, fruits, and grains, much like the first pyramid. The fourth section uses a nutrient name. So fruits and vegetables and grains are foods. Protein isn't a food, it's a nutrient. And most of us, when we think protein, think what? We think meat or dairy. We think animal foods. So it's saying, much like the first pyramid, you can have some animal foods. There's a little room on the plate and a little side over here. Or for protein, you can choose plant-based foods that are rich in protein to make sure you get enough. So all foods contain protein. Some contain more protein than others. So you can choose those foods which contain more protein than others. Why is the dairy specified? Again, that's politics. I actually at one point worked for the dairy industry and the dairy industry is fighting hard to keep its presence. You're not gonna hear me poo poo any foods. What you're gonna hear me talk about is the science. And the science says mostly plants, fewer animals. I worked for the dairy industry. I accept less dairy is best. Again, nobody has to consume dairy, nobody has to consume meat, but for those who choose to, it is appropriate in a balanced diet and it does have benefits. So the goal is to leave an image in everyone's mind that allows for that cultural diversity, those differences in preferences, those differences in needs based on all of the different aspects of the individual. So let me minimize back down to your book, and I will point out that that's what's being explained on the next several pages. So please don't skip any of this. It brings you to this. All of this is very important. I would read the first chapter in great detail. We then get over to the nutrition facts label. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop right now so that this video isn't too long. And then I'm going to record another shorter one, a part two, if you will. So you'll see part one and you'll see part two um, just because it's easier from a, um, an uploading standpoint.